So the prices are, uh, for the most part, I mean, I'm the one recommending prices on my developments, right? The ones I work on. I don't know how my competitors work, or how um, you know the bigger developers work. But for the most part, they're looking at our recommendations. And um, no, I, I don't think it's a futures price. It, it's a price based on what someone will pay today for that unit. If you're going to try and suck all the gravy out of buying a presale, then why would anybody buy it? Why wouldn't they just wait? Well, come to the Big Deal Real Estate Podcast, where we talk about things pertaining to Vancouver real estate, its suburbs, and business in general. We also like to bring on people who are kind of a big deal from time to time. I'm your co-host, That Asia Kelly, here with Jerry White, aka that guy that does mortgages. If you're watching this on YouTube, leave a comment, please, and like the video, and subscribe to the channel for more content just like this. Click the bell to be notified every time more content just like this comes out and do all the same stuff on all the other platforms. <clears throat> Our guest today. <laughs> <laughs> Our guest today, business owner, realtor, tough guy, Trevor Street. <laughs> Yeah, Why are you talking yeah, like that? that? That's intro. my podcast voice. <laughs> That's my podcast voice. <laughs> okay. All right, th Trevor. Th thank you for having me. Of course. My pleasure, man. I guess do you want to uh, tell the listeners a bit about who you are and what you do? Um, my name is Trevor Street. I'm the CEO of the Partners Marketing Group. We're a company that specializes in uh, land acquisitions and, more importantly, the, uh, the marketing and sale of pre-sale townhomes and condominiums in the suburban areas of Greater Vancouver. Awesome. So how are you finding the pre-sale market right now? The pre-sale market right now is probably a lot busier than most, like we're a lot busier than most resale agents are, like most regular like like Remax kind of guys are. Um, it's certainly not the like fever pitch that we saw like this time last year. But it is a lot busier than I would say most people expect. People are wanting to dodge the high rates. <laughs> like, well, I oh, think close in a couple of years. Hopefully, it'll be even better. By well, then. yeah, exactly. And I mean, I think people have common sense, right? They look yeah. at the immigration numbers. They look at no real changes happening yeah. in terms of housing supply, yeah. right? So there's a thousand people a day moving to Canada. These are ready-made families, right? Yeah. And I think people look at that, and then they look at how it takes longer to get approval to build something uh, than it does to actually build it in Greater Vancouver, and they're thinking this is probably a better bet than you know the S and P five hundred or something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. Is that the actual like it, it actually takes longer to get an approval to build than it does to build? Oh yeah, in some cases twice as long. Really? Yeah, like that's that's the major problem, right? And so you there's also this massive issue with. Like when we look at the pro forma on, on what it costs to build a building, we actually have to add about 30% for soft costs for things like all the city fees, uh, all of the consultants, and then just the interest on the loans, right? So, you know, when you're talking about a $5 million loan, you're talking about, you know, this, this is, you know, six figures of interest every year the developer has to factor in. So, wow. yeah, so it, it, contrib it contributes to making a lot of these projects not viable. Right. Yeah. So in terms of like, you're talking about soft costs and stuff like mm -hmm. that, um, what are you seeing right now for like cost to build wood frame, like mid rise and like, do you have insight into that? I do. Um, <clears throat> most of the, most of that insight would be proprietary um, to the developers that I work with. And there, there are different numbers everywhere I go. <laughs> every every guy I talk to, yeah. and and you know hard cost, soft cost. It's it's going to be different based on the municipality because a lot of these municipalities have different requirements as well, which again contributes to uh, the, the housing crisis we have. Right, right. right. So. so something that um, I think a lot of people are curious about is like, how are these developers coming up with the prices for pre sales? Is that a future projection of where they think prices will be or how do they come up with that price 
So the prices are, uh, for the most part, I mean, I'm the one recommending prices on my developments, right? The ones I work on. I don't know how my competitors work, or how um, you know the bigger developers work. But for the most part, they're looking at our recommendations. And um, no, I, I don't think it's a futures price. It, it's a price based on what someone will pay today for that unit. If you're going to try and suck all the gravy out of buying a presale, then why would anybody buy it? Why wouldn't they just wait? Right? Is People there any like specific calculation you do to come up with that price, or you just kind of know based on square footage that that's how much it should go for in today's? No, and I like, and I might get you know beat up in the parking lot for saying this, but I am. I think that price per square foot is the single most overused financial metric, not just in real estate, anywhere, like including price to earnings ratios in the equity market. I think it's. It's a, to me, it's a number that Microsoft Excel spits out. So I, I just, I, and that's my little rant about price per square foot. But um, what it is, like I said, I'm, I'm literally, I'm looking at what else is available. I'm looking at what people are paying, um, what units are being absorbed, which ones aren't. And that's what I'm basing the pricing on, what someone will pay within the absorption timeline my developer wants. Mm -hmm. And I, and I guess, so in, in regards to that, because pre-sales are always typically priced slightly above like market value of a brand new ready to move in unit for the most part. Um, it depends on what the market's doing. I mean, that's not something that um, I would be doing right now, personally. I, again, I, I think that you've, you've got to show a, a buyer that there's a reason that they're buying your unit. There's a reason you're, they're waiting two years. Right. So, I mean, I certainly don't want to price my product in, at the same price that someone is, that a resale agent is pricing something down the street that's ready to move because that resale agent is giving his client at the kitchen table a price to sell that unit in two weeks, three weeks kind of thing. Right. Um, if I sell one unit every two weeks, every three weeks, I'm going to be out of a job. I'm going to be on that site for years. Right. Right. So we got to price those things to move. I see. So, yeah. I mean, I guess that's a massive benefit with pre-sales then. Because um, obviously you get the flexibility of not having to get the mortgage right now and blah, 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 right? Well, yeah. I mean, I, I've bought, I think I've, I've bought 10 pre-sales myself in my life, 10 or 12 in my life. And I've, I've always made money on them. Um, I've never regretted a single one that I've done. Really? They, they yeah. just have to compete with the, the fact that you can't move into it right away. And some people want to move into something right away. It, yeah, that's yeah. kind of the, the main competition aspect of it is just the moving move in time. Well, exactly. And so yeah. and what you'll see is that when the market is like this, where there's standing resale inventory yeah. uh, and use the people that actually want to move into it are not buying it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they can go yeah, buy something to move into. Mainly it, yeah, it's people that want to want to invest, which is we need that, too. We need we need yeah. rental accommodation. Right. So, you know, vacancy rates in Surrey are like what sub one percent right now. They gotta be like pretty well as close to zero as you can get. Yeah, so I mean, we, the market needs both, but when the market is really crazy, like it was last year, and you know, I mean, you've probably experienced it. You have buyers that have lost five, six, seven multiple offers. That's when we see the people that actually want to live in the unit showing up because they're just done with the whole situation out there. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so where, where do you think the value is right now in the market? Like if you were like, would you buy, would you go pre-sale, would you go resale? Where would you go with that money? Like, what do you think? For me, I mean, the way the market functions is that the developers have to get about half of the building sold before the bank will lend them any money in order to build the building. So if you've got, you're sitting there with 40% sales and the market stalls out on you, it's too bad, so sad, those bankers don't care you're not getting your draw to build the building. So that first half of the of the building is going to be excellent value because the developers, the guys marketing it, they want to get to that 50% point so that they can get the bank financing to build the building. After that point, they don't really care. So if I were an investor looking in the market right now, what I'd be looking for is pre-construction sites, pre-sale sites that are at the front end of their marketing campaign, uh, the front end of their inventory, and just comparing it to what else is available right now. There's great deals in Surrey, right? I think Surrey is really undervalued, um, Surrey Central. Um, good deals, Abbotsford I think is really good. Um, one area I really like, it's pretty stabby right now, 
Um, <laughs> but it, it reminds me of downtown Port Coquitlam when I was growing up, yeah. right? Uh, is Maple Ridge. Maple Ridge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's a little like my <laughs> office is that like two twenty second in Logan. Okay, well that that's yeah. that like that's like the worst little hot center in it, Maple Ridge. Oh, it, yeah. it's it's all straight up saying it's the downtown east side yeah. of the suburbs, <laughs> right? But in my opinion, as a real estate investor, those areas that have a lot of room to transition yeah. are the areas I want to buy in. To me, like I don't want to buy in Yale Town, right? That's already turned over. There's no upside there aside from market appreciation. Whereas, like, I remember, like, there was, a re- there was a reason that for years and years and years there was no real estate offices in Port Coquitlam because nobody wanted a Port Coquitlam address on their business card. Really? Yeah, because it was, like, the black sheep of the Tri-Cities, right? You guys are too young to remember, but it was, like, when I was growing up, it was, like, white trash, like, very working, like, punch-ups in the street. Like, in Poco? Poco. That's what I mean, right? You say oh, that wow. now. But when I was growing up, like po- downtown Poco, Poco Quitlam itself, it was what like what Haney is today. And years from now, they'll say Haney, that was a stabby place. What? That, exactly right. <laughs> well, there's well, you you still to this day cannot have a nightclub in Port Coquitlam. Oh really? Because we had one. What was it? Where, rumors, right? It was rumors. Yeah. Right. And um, like they they just had constant problems. They got my powerlifting coach was a bouncer there, and he like. He said, like, they, they, they just have the paddy wagon ready. Yeah. Right? The owner so, of that club was my my older brother's ex-wife's husband. And I think he got murdered in that club. I think that's when they closed it down. Because yeah. somebody got killed outside of it. And that, yeah. that was the final straw. And they said, no more. That's it. Um, and so, but I mean, so the reason that I'm telling this story is to contrast what Poco was like when I was growing up compared with what it's like now and, like, the surprise in, in your voice is that's the that's the shock that I get from a lot of people. Well, I, I would live in Ridge. I live in Ridge right now. Well, I live I live in Ridge, but I live in the Silver Valley. Yeah, but right? like, I would still buy so. there if honestly, because I know eventually like it will turn around. Well, well Tent City's yeah. already gone. Yeah. Well, it, it will. <laughs> it's a nice t- little park. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice little park, and you know it will it will turn over. And the thing is, is that when you have an area like downtown Port Coquitlam that is really nice, it's it's really built out already. Um, but those stores are generating good rent for the develop for the owners. It's really hard to turn that those sites over, right? Right. Whereas an area like downtown Maple Ridge, it's a lot easier to turn those development sites over. So I think that you, you if we have we have a new council, a new mayor and council in Maple Ridge, um, if they have their priorities straight and they're you know they're they're thinking about outcomes, not ideology, we'll have uh, we should see mm-hmm. some changes in Maple Ridge faster than you would probably expect. Yeah, I completely agree with everything you just said. Like, I've been talking about Maple Ridge for a while, man, but like, people are all like, oh, what? why would you buy there? You know, it's such a bad area and blah, blah, blah. But it's like, mm-hmm. yes, but that is why you're buying there before it becomes a good area because well, you, it will be. You hit the nail on the head and I don't think that there are policies in place that are going to keep it a bad area, yeah. right? Because there are areas further in that you know areas I don't I certainly don't specialize in but f- further in towards Vancouver and within Vancouver itself where there are policies specific policies in place that are whatever their the intention was the outcome is going to be that they are going to stay bad areas yeah right yeah like I'm not, I'm not gonna buy on, yeah I'm not gonna buy on East Hastings right like you know what I mean but like yeah. Maple Ridge there's nothing really obviously they want to make that area a better area and there's yeah. nothing keeping it a bad area right and then it's like people always like look at wally man like even like seven years ago wally was a disgusting place like oh, every, yeah. and now every investor loves wally they want to buy yeah. there it's still up and coming but it's got a long way to go yeah right but already the stigma behind it is halfway changed it's not fully there but it's halfway changed well exactly and i mean i mean for me to look at the marketplace and look at prices in surrey central um, or where like Galilee is just south of Surrey Central, and have those prices comparable to Willoughby, that to me is insane. Yeah. It's insane. There's so much more value in Surrey, right? If you just look at what the future holds for that area yeah. and like think five years ahead instead of like what's right in front of you. Um, to me, if I you know same apartment, same same pricing, same everything. You know, I'm buying Surrey eight days a week. Hundred percent. 
right? Yeah. People are so focused on the micro, like <clears throat> what's going on right now. Yeah. People completely forget to look at what's happening long term. Like oh. five hundred thousand mm-hmm. people moving here. Mm-hmm. We're not like the amount of homes that we're building has completely dropped off a cliff, paired with the fact that there's five hundred thousand people moving here. It's just like it's basic supply and demand. How are prices like some a bunch of people would have to die or people would have to stop moving here. That's the only thing that's going to stop prices. Well, well, we, well we just had a once in a century uh, international pandemic. In we the did. Right? It didn't seem <laughs> to it too well, wasn't well, it? No. <laughs> Prices went up through that entire pandemic quite yeah. substantially. Yeah, no, I agree. And I mean, I, I just, I, I think that you look at city of Surrey, for example, and you know, this is one of the biggest myths uh, misconceptions, mistruths, whatever you want to call it, fake news that I hear. I constantly hear people talking. The justification for you know the influence of foreign buyers on the market is, well, the number of building permits is equal to the number of households being created. So why are prices still going up? And it's why we need to start teaching economics in schools. Okay, If you have 8,000 households being created and you have 8,000 units of housing, of course prices are going up because what you're relying on is those 8,000 units of housing being an exact fit for those 8,000 households that have Mm. been created. But if you created 8,000 detached houses, for example, and there's 8,000 households, that's not going to work for the market, right? So this is why planned economies fail. And that's basically what we have in BC. We have a planned economy for housing. Interesting. That's something I've never even thought of before. If you think about it, what we have for an economy and housing, if, if you look at the economic history of the Soviet Union, right, um, we have we don't have a capitalist system when it comes to housing in yeah. BC. We have much more akin to the supply controls, um, the supply quotas, the highly subjective, um, you know, very uh, strange motivational factors associated with supply creation. It's much more akin to a, a planned economy than it is to a free market capitalist system. Yeah, right? totally. So. Uh, I mean, like even just looking at like I was so I heard uh, I heard of a realtor from another realtor who just sold a 500 square foot one bed in Carisdale, yeah. 3000 bucks a square feet. So it was like, yeah, what, 1.5 million for that one bed? Yeah. You look at Brentwood, it's like 1500 bucks a square foot. Mm-hmm. You look at Surrey, which is basically going to be another Brentwood in the next probably eight years, yeah. or at least close to it, right? And you can still get units for like 900 bucks a square foot there. Yeah, I mean, you look at... Um, hey, don't be using that measurement. That's r- Oh, that's right. And we need to come <laughs> back to that, actually. I want you to dive into that some more. Um, I mean, I just, like I said, I buy where the future is, right? To me, personally, <clears> as, <throat> as a... As a real estate investor, I have no interest in Vancouver. I have no interest in Brentwood. I have no interest in Metro Town, right? I like Surrey. I like Abbotsford. I like Chilliwack. I like Maple Ridge. I just, I, I'm, I, I watch the transformation of Port Coquitlam. I live there. I grew up there, right? Yeah. And so I see how fast it can happen when the government gets out of the way. Like the reason Port Coquitlam changed so fast is they blanket rezoned the entire downtown area of Port Coquitlam. So that's a very that's very different from an official community plan, which is what they have in most areas. So an official community plan dictates what you can rezone something into, but you still have to go through that 18 month process, right? Public hearings, all that kind of stuff. When they blanket rezone the entire area, they couldn't legally turn down a development permit. They couldn't legally stop mm. the developers from building, right? Right. And so once we saw government get out of the way, the area flourished. And government may not be getting out of the way in these different areas, but the change will happen. It will come. Yeah. 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 There's much more growth potential in the valley than there is west closer to Vancouver, and I would agree 100%. Pardon the interruption, guys. This podcast is sponsored by Stonehouse Realty. Stonehouse Realty has one-on-one coaching with top producers every Friday. We have training at least three times a week. If you look at the January training schedule as of 2023, it's crazy. There's like two trainings a day every day. So if you're a new agent looking to make a change or anybody looking to get their real estate license, you can reach right out to us, schedule an appointment, and we'll get you in. Stonehouse Realty, experience the difference. Why exactly is it that you don't like the measurement price per square foot and everyone uses it? 
So everyone uses it. I think it comes out of downtown. Now, downtown Vancouver is like BC Lions games and like steak joints for yeah. me. Like I, it might as well be Edmonton to me as far as, you know, as a, as a real estate yeah. professional. I don't do business there. I've never done business there. My buddies that work there, they say you go one block in one direction. It's completely different from a block in another direction, right? So mm -hmm. to me, like if I, I got no interest in it, right? But that price per square foot thing, it may work in the city. Um, but you look at Maple Ridge, for example. So everything in the suburbs, the density is driven by parking. So when I get a piece of dirt that lands in my lap, the first thing I'm looking at is how much parking I'm going to get out of the site. Do you guys follow me? Yeah. So floor space ratio, like the size of the land, yeah. that'll determine how much floor area we can build, how much condo building we can build. But the amount of parking we get determines how many units we can carve that floor area up into. Does that make sense yeah. so far? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So obviously the smaller the units, the higher the price per square foot. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Right. You yeah. Right. Yeah. So in Maple Ridge, there's the downtown business district, and inside of this magic little area that, that the city of Maple Ridge has created, the parking requirements are like sixty percent of what they are on the other side of the street from the downtown business district. district okay. Right. Yeah. So all of a sudden, you have an mm -hmm. acre of land inside the central business district and an acre of land on the outside of the central business district. They yield the same oh. amount of parking, they yield the, yield the same amount of floor area, mm -hmm. but the guys on the outside of the central business district, their average size is like 800 square feet on the inside of the business district is like 500 square feet. Because so they, don't, they can't use as much for parking. They can't, exactly, yeah. right? So the parking requirements are way higher outside the central business district. So what ends up happening is the guy that's outside the central business district, he might have the marketing campaign of the century and do an awesome job based on the prices of those individual units. And the guy on the inside of the central business district could do an absolute garbage job, right? Mm -hmm. But because he has smaller units, his price per square foot looks a lot better. And so when people say, oh, this was price per square foot, they got this price per square foot, they got this price per square foot. Well, did they have a double underground or a single underground? Because again, that's going to impact how many square feet you can chop that floor area up into, right? Which is right. going to influence the price per square foot. So, it's 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 just not a metric I use. It doesn't mean it doesn't mean anything to me, right? Especially and even if you said, oh well, what's the average unit size? Well, again, even if you had the same average unit size, well, if Connor, if you're marketing a building where your average unit size is 800 square feet. And I'm marketing a building where my average unit size is 800 square feet. But most of your 800 square foot units are one in dens. And most of my 800 square foot units are two in dens. Well, even if you, you do a way better job marketing than I do, my guy's going to make more money. I'm going to have a higher price per square foot. So it's just, it's just this oversimplified, over relied upon metric. Um, like there's a whole intelligence system that goes into pricing these buildings that we have in place. Um, and it's, I just, I, I think when I hear people talking about price per square foot, it's just a mix your blood boil. <laughs> well, it just, it, it, it's, it's just not a, a metric yeah. that we use in the field as all. Well. Interesting. So. I'd like to hear your take on a one bed and den. Mm -hmm. Like I noticed all these pre-sales, like if it's like, you know, a 90 unit low rise, whatever, they put mm -hmm. like five of them in the whole building. There'll mm -hmm. be barely any one yeah. bed and dens. Do you think a one bed and den is an ideal investment it's interesting because we used to like we used to despise one in dens right um because you, you go from a 550 square foot one bedroom to a 650 square foot one bedroom in den and you don't get much more money for that extra 100 square feet for the developer we'd rather put that extra 100 square feet into a two bedroom right right um, but sometimes you just end up with some dead space at the back of the unit. That's where you put the den in. That's how you end up with them. Um, but what we saw after the pandemic or during the pandemic was that all of a sudden those 650 square foot one bedroom and den started, started carrying their own weight. Because of the you know, home offices. Because of the home offices, exactly. Yeah. And now guys want them. So now you will see a premium for that extra 100 square feet. And, you know, I think, I mean, personally, I would just run the numbers. Yeah. If you know you talk to your um, your professional property manager, 
right? And ask them, you know, what what is that extra hundred square feet going to get me yeah. in rent? Does it make sense? Because people working from home, they want an office for sure, but a two bed's way more than the one bed and den. Yeah. yeah. So the one bed and den's <clears throat> ideal unless they want an office in the living room. That's, that's not ideal. So. Yeah. Right. But like. I wonder if like, so like obviously a one bed and den fills, fills a void that we have in the market between the, the, the that two That didn't products. previously really exist. Right. Right? Yeah. But what I'm curious about is when it comes to resale, yeah. do you think your buyer pool is going to be way smaller for a one bed and den? I don't think necessarily. And it's part of like you were saying, is, is the, 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 the two home. bed is just so much more now. Right? Yeah. You know, when, when I was selling, when I started selling pre-sales in Port Coquitlam, I mean, we were selling, you know, two bedroom units in the high 200,000s. Wow. Right? So, yeah, you're not going to get a premium because you have a den. Someone's just going to jump to a, someone's going to jump to a, a two bedroom. Right. Right? But now there is that kind There's of, big gap. there is room for that middle ground and people are putting a value on it. So, right. yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think that there's anything necessarily special about a one in den, but I do think that if, if the deal itself makes sense for you, Go for it, for sure. Yeah. I mean, I would I would say that, you know, if you had two, a one bed and a one bed and den that were exactly the same square footage, I think the one bed and den should trade a little bit higher. Oh, if they're the exact same square footage, yeah. absolutely they will. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. So that being said, is it time to buy a pre-sale right now? It's time to buy a pre-sale if you're buying the right pre-sale. And so we were talking a little bit about this before we started recording and you were like, no, 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 no. Save it. Save it. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, going back to the way the market functions, right? So we got to get to that 50% point really quick. But what we're seeing is that there's a lot of there's a lot of product on the market where the prices were just never adjusted when after things came down that. last year, and a lot of that product is situations where the developers have their financing in place. The marketers aren't getting paid. The builders not getting paid until the building's built, anyways. So they might as well ride this out because they know the situation is temporary, right? Now is not the time to buy those pre-sales, right? Um, and what I'm also seeing, and this is a big mistake that I think a lot of marketers are making, is they're looking at what everyone else is charging in the neighborhood, and they're looking at those sites where the people, you know, have hit their pre-sale requirement, and then they're pricing their pre-sales. Based. based on that and then they're chasing ghosts yeah so where you want to buy is like i said somewhere um where the numbers make sense the developers right now to get the absorption that they want remember we were talking about like you can't price it to sell one every two weeks to get the absorption they want they're offering really good deals really good incentives right now so but you've just got to find those pre-sales right yeah right but you typically always want to try and get in on the first fifty percent of a project, you want to get in as early as possible, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, do you think pre-sale prices will come down anymore? I don't know. like for condos. I don't know how they can. Like the price of construction keeps going up. They're amending the the BC Building Code is being amended right now. It's going to be more expensive to produce this stuff. So I just I think that you people if prices continue to go down but the cost of construction stays where it is. A lot of these sites, they'll just get shelved. Yeah. Right? Like, if, if, if people think, like, oh, I'm going to hold out and I'm going to buy a two bedroom in Surrey for, you know, 500 grand or something, like, I, I, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. Right? So, you can't pick a bottom, you can't pick a top. But for me, like, I, I made an acquisition at the end of last year. I knew full well that, yeah, there's a good possibility that by this summer, it could be down from the price I paid. I don't really care. I'm a, I'm a long-term like buy and hold guy. Yeah. I just buy and hold, buy and hold, Accumulate. buy and hold. Yeah. Once yeah. the renos are done on this place that I bought, um, I'll go and I'll pick up another one. Right. Yeah. So. Sweet. Who are you using as your realtor? <laughs> <laughs> on that one, some dude in Prince George. Oh yeah. Oh, you're gonna buy in Prince George? Uh, that, that's that's where I bought the most recent ones. So I've always all... I've always been interested in Prince George. In, uh, Prince George. Well, we should do a, a po- uh, We should get him down here. You can do a Prince George podcast. I'd be down for but, that. But uh, no, I think I've got all the appreciation property. Like you're buying in Greater Vancouver, it's an appreciation play. Yeah. Right. You're not like 
you're not, not like maybe you're, there's not a thousand bucks it's just cash flow play. yeah there's yeah. no there's no like real cash flow like you're not getting a thousand yeah. bucks a month in your jeans in fact a lot of these properties you're you know you're feeding the gator two three hundred bucks a month yeah. right personally i'd rather feed the gator two three hundred bucks a month so 30 call it thirty six hundred dollars a year i'd rather feed the gator thirty six hundred dollars a year on a piece of vancouver real estate than put thirty six hundred dollars a year in an rrsp yeah i th- I, I again i Ten years from now, I think you'll be happier with the piece of Vancouver real estate. But Completely agree. I could be wrong. Yeah, I don't know. So. Who knows? I agree though. <laughs> I just made a video on that today, actually. Oh. Uh, all right, the big three. Hit him, Jarrett. Where do you see yourself in five years? On a boat? <laughs> no. Um, five years from now, honestly, I, we made the decision this past week um, that we're that we're going to hold off on accepting new customers for the time being. So five years from now, we may start, we may be accepting new customers, but right now the existing customer base we have is what we have. Um, I see myself just, I don't want to be the biggest. I want to be the best. And so I want to continue to have the best marketing programs, um, offer the best value to our customers, right? At the end of the day, we're not selling real estate. And as, as corny as it sounds, what we're selling is we're selling wealth. That's why people are buying from us because they want to be wealthy. They want to build wealth, right? right. So we want, to con- we want to be the best people out there at offering consumers wealth. Gotcha. So that's where I want to be in five years. Awesome. Yeah. And if you could go back to your early 20s, what would you do differently? <sighs> um, keeping it PG? No. <laughs> um, buy more real estate? Yeah. I, if I could go back in time, I would buy every single thing. Back in the day, you could actually buy stuff in the morning and on the cash flowed. So I would have bought everything I could of the cash flowed. But I'd play life like Monopoly, just buy every single piece. Yeah. Just buy, yeah. I mean, just buy. But uh, no, no that's what I would do yeah. if I go back to my early twenties. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What's your biggest win? And your biggest loss? It's oh. the hardest one. My biggest win would would undoubtedly be. In business or in life? In general. In, in general. It could be anything. 20 years ago yesterday, I was inducted into, uh, I was sworn in as a member of the C4 Islanders of Canada, a light infantry regiment out of Vancouver. That changed my life. Joining the Canadian military changed my life. No way. And everything that I have today, my wife, my family, my business, all stems from what I learned at that regiment. So you're not just a fake tough guy, you're a real tough guy. <laughs> no, I'm a fake tough guy. I'm yeah. soft now, man. I've been a civilian for 10 years. No. That, that uh, I, owe, I owe everything I have to the regiment. That's awesome, man. Yeah. I didn't know that about you. Cool. Yeah. Biggest so. loss. We'll keep his thinking face in the... <laughs> and you, the thing is, is you told me you were going to ask these questions yeah um it's a tough one man okay so i got one for you so we the first it's actually the first building that i did for um two of my biggest customers we our contracts back then did not specify the upgrade price for a second parking stall it just whether or not it included it, and then we calculated it manually. So it didn't have a value for the second parking stall if you bought an upgraded parking stall. And what ended up happening, and we didn't have any provisions in the contract for getting rid of the stall uh, if we ran, if we lost a stall or something like that. So we oversold uh, a whole bunch of parking stalls at one of the sites we did. Oh and wow! We had no provision to claw them back in the contract. And so I basically had to start calling these realtors and these buyers to stri- try to strike a deal with them. And um, I ended up covering the net losses to the developers. So oh, wow. like I sold a stall that didn't exist um, for 15 grand. Well, that stall didn't exist in the first place. So they weren't out money um, on but the first 15. they think they're getting a stall. But when the guy says to me, well, I'm not giving it up, unless you give me 20 grand, it's... What are you going to do? What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to eat the difference for the developer. So um, that was about a $40,000 check I wrote. Sheesh. Yeah, and uh, 
our graphic designer at the time, she says, wow, Trev, you know, for that amount of money, you could have just hired somebody for a full year to just count parking stalls for you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was when we made the decision to hire our, our lovely transaction coordinator, Stephanie, um, who, among other many other things, uh, does count the parking stalls for me. Um, and costs a lot more than forty thousand dollars. <laughs> Stephanie, if you're listening, you're worth every penny. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, can we talk about the Jacob? Can we talk about Jacob. That? We yeah. can talk about Jacob for yeah. sure. Can what? What's up with that? I'm excited for that one. I am too. Um, I might have gone a little light on the pricing. It looks like so. It. Yeah. So, uh, get there on day one. <laughs> <laughs> What's the We've Jacob? already started fill me, to fill me in on this. What's Jacob's the Jacob? uh, is a condo site in uh, in Abbotsford. Oh, in Abbotsford. And this okay. is like, in my mind, because I love like the old town Abbotsford. Yeah. Right. Like the the character of that downtown mm-hmm. area. To me, it's like one of the best locations in Abbotsford because you just walk down the hill and you're there. Right? Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, like I said, we might have gone a little light on the pricing there. So get there day one. Um, it's going to be an incredible site. Lots of one beddies, lots of one in dens. Um, Do you know how many units it is yet? Oh yeah, yeah, it's, I think it's 144 units, I believe. Oh, that's a pretty big site. It's a pretty big site. Yeah, we're only releasing half the building right now. Okay. Um, and it'll be, uh, that'll be coming mid-February. Mid-Feb, okay. Yeah. No. Yeah, that area, historic downtown, I've coined it as the Fort Langley of Abbotsford. The Fort that's what Langley of Abbotsford. thinking Abbotsford. in my head, or, or the gas town of Abbotsford, it is a cool area. It's so cool. And like, don't like, if you want to go check it out, do yourself a favor, like as an investor, do, you know, 20 minutes of due diligence. Don't drive it. Go park and walk the site or walk the downtown area. Yeah. Cause you're not going to get a feel for it by driving through it. Go walk, poke your head into these shops, you know, go grab a coffee. It's not like downtown Maple Ridge is right now where it's just dead. Like it's a lively downtown core. It is. There, yeah, there's right? an ice cream place there that just goes nuts. It's like Banter. lineups. Yeah, lineups all out the door every single day. Yeah, my wife said there's some bakery out it's there. Called too. Ban- Banter, yeah. And Banter's the ice cream. It's one. always busy. They oh, like wow. they like cook the waffle cones like in front of you and roll it and it's <laughs> This is that that's why the other countries hate us. Right, like yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. straight up. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and then they got like Fieldhouse Brewing, right? And they've got they they're bringing another brewery to that area, mm-hmm. Old Yale or whatever. It's like 220 seats. So I'm with you, man. I, I like I love that area a lot. I mean, I've had some people say they don't like that area. I'm like, what? how do you? I don't understand. Like that's all you can ask for in an area. You know what I mean? I, I've got two units um, up on Campbell there. Uh, so over at the Abacus Building. Okay. Yeah. And. I've I've had those units for probably six seven years. I've never had a vacancy of more than a week. Wow. Two units for seven years, like it, it, they always go immediately. Yeah, actually, I, I remember Mission and Abbotsford have the lowest vacancy rates in North America. Uh, as of that was two or three years ago. I don't know what it is today, but I know at one point uh, lowest in North America. Well, it's still abysmal today, and yeah. you know. Um, I don't understand the decisions that are being made in Victoria. It's like we rely on we rely on people volunteering to produce rental housing. Let's make it. Let, let's disincentivize creating rental housing. Yeah, <laughs> and then like, the price goes up. Yeah, right? the price, and then the people like me that can just sit and hold it. Yeah, like we're the ones that benefit. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, the smaller players, the mom and pops, will drop out. Yeah. Right. They can't take it. They can't handle it. They don't want to deal with the tenants, but for for me and for like the the my friends and the other guys that, that that do this, we hire professional property managers. We don't have to deal with headaches. No, right. And so, but what it does is when you disincentivize being a landlord, you make you tilt things so far in favor of the tenants. All it does is it helps enri- enrich people like me. It makes things harder for the tenants, and it pushes the the smaller landlords just out of the market. Yeah. I find that anytime the government intervenes, that's kind of the result. It creates like a negative feedback loop, right? Like mm-hmm. rental prices are high, 
let's Im- implement all these rules mm-hmm. and then now people don't want to be landlords then there's less supply of rental housing that pushes up prices which makes tenants more angry then they implement more rules <laughs> it's like literally just a, a negative feedback loop of people getting angry and prices going up well and again that that's that's what i was speaking about earlier like i said with, with you know we we've we've we're shifting more and more in the direction of a planned economy, yeah. right? And with planned rights and planned, um, you know, ways that you can rent a suite and all of this kind of stuff. And these things produce shortages, right? Yeah. So, but at the end of the day, like I said, it's it, and like you said, it it it's people like me that benefit from these policies, right? The last six years under Trudeau and under the NDP, they've been the best six years um, that I've had. Yeah. as a realtor and as a landlord, <laughs> Yeah, right? And, you know, you ask some guy, um, you know, that's turning a wrench or swinging a hammer, you know, how the last six years have been for him. And unfortunately, he's not going to tell you the same thing. No, 100%. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, cool, man. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, of course. no worries. All right. And give him the floor. The floor? Oh, yeah, the floor. We, we're giving you the floor on this podcast. What do you say to the listeners? Piece of advice, anything. Something insightful, uh, like a like a face your fears kind of thing. You have anything like that? <laughs> kind of locked and ready to go in the hopper. <laughs> if you, for most people, they have a barrier for action. So your barrier for action is probably in the realm of two to three, or two to three qu- unanswered questions. Most people, if they have one question before they'll take an action they'll figure out how to get that answer, that, that answer. And if the answer is satisfactory, they'll make a decision. But as soon as you get to a, an action barrier of two, three, or four, people will generally just throw their hands up and walk away because they can't emotionally get to where they need to be in order to make a decision. So for me, when we were talking about that, that purchase I made in Prince George, there was a massive barrier to making a decision. But a skill that I've learned is to write down all of those questions and systematically answer each one. So if you find yourself stuck, you find yourself that you can't make a decision, it's because your barrier for action is you just have, there's just too many questions and you can't articulate them all at once. So you're just, your mind's just throwing its hands up and saying no. Hmm. Figure out what your barrier to action is, write down those questions, answer them systematically, and you'll make a good quality decision. That was good. Nice job. All right. If you guys are still around watching this, thumbs up, like, subscribe, tick the bell to be notified, and definitely subscribe. See you on the next one. Peace.